You're watching Cherry Red TV and my name's Mark Powell. I'm the label manager of Esoteric Recordings. At the end of May 2015, Esoteric are reissuing the album The Not Forgotten Association by a uh, renowned poet and lyricist Pete Brown. And uh, I'm happy to say that with me today on Cherry Red TV is Pete Brown. Hey. Pete, it's lovely to have you here. And um, a lot's happening for you in... in uh, in, in May. In fact, a lot's happening for you this year. You've had a, a documentary has, has, has been made about you. Um, you're involved, uh, I understand, with a, a project at the Roundhouse as well, which is in, involving um, as a celebration of the fact that uh, you were involved in those, the famous sort of poetry events at the Albert Hall. 50 years uh, ago. 50 years ago. Uh, how does it feel to still be sort of right be in this position 50 years on from all that? Well, this year's been good, I have to say. Um, it started gathering a bit of momentum last year. Um, uh, what I love best is performing, you know, whether it be my poetry or singing with my band or, or, or with other bands. And um, I've always tried to push my life in that direction. Unfortunately, life has been pushing back in the other direction quite often. So I find myself doing other things, um, producing records, uh, writing lots of songs with different people, which is my, my bread and butter kind of work. Um, film screenplays sometimes as well. Um, and uh, finally, as it seems to be, a few people getting round to the idea that I'm still here and uh, that I might still have something to say and, 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 and um, uh, so I'm getting a bit more, more attention than, than, than I have done for some time, um, which I love, you know, what the hell, I mean, I, I've, I've always been there but, but waiting to be discovered. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, taking you all the all, all the way back, I, I guess the start of your your career, uh, b b before uh, sort of you be you became known as a as a lyricist. Uh, obviously, the the poetry thing. You were involved with um, experience with poetry and jazz, going back to the sort of the very early days of all that sort of yes. stuff in, in London. Well, what happened was that that um, I met this guy Mike Horowitz, who's a great poet. We still work together sometimes, and he had a uh, a loose organisation called New Departures, which uh, was a it was a magazine, and also there was a kind of performance group, which sometimes included bits of theatre, poetry, jazz, um, other kinds of music like avant-garde music and stuff like that. Um, John Cage, Lamont Young, those kind of things as well. It's quite varied. Um, and uh, we did a lot of performances, and eventually, it it turned out that the thing was mo that was most viable was to have me and him as poets, and a group of jazz musicians. Um, and, and we started off with people like Dick Hextall Smith and Graham Bond. Then eventually, we had a regular unit, which was uh, with Bobby Wellens and Stan Tracy and Jeff Klein and Laurie Morgan, and. Um, uh, we did a lot of performances with that and had a residency at the Marquis in 1963. Um, and um, I was always a great lover of jazz and blues in particular and always was around the jazz scene as a, as a fan of, of, of jazz. And so I got to know all the jazz musicians. Among the jazz musicians that I got to know um, uh, were... Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, and they knew I was... By the time it got to 1965 and we did the Albert Hall thing with Ginsberg and Ferlinghetti and, and all those people, then my, I was reasonably well known on the well, sort of cultural beat, whatever you like to call it, scene. And everyone knew that I loved music and was a big fan. And so that was when Ginger got in touch and said, hey, we've formed this band called Cream. Do you want to come and help us out with some lyrics? You know, we think it might be a good idea. So that was another great big jump. Um, 
after the Albert Hall, I was in regular work for the first time in my life, probably. Uh, um, I, I had gone deliberately professional I, I, because I realised, well, I felt that I, I didn't want to do anything else but perform and write. So I, I abandoned all other forms of support in about 1960. Um, got the occasional job, I mean, casual job, including helping build the Indica bookshop with Paul McCartney, because Barry Miles was a friend of mine and he asked me to help. Um, and the last known job that I had, I think, was as a as a an assistant chef in a bistro in Chalk Farm, which was ahead of its time and became a laundrette. <laughs> um, and, um, and then because of the Albert Hall thing and because I was getting around quite a bit and the name was about, then I think that was one of the things that prompted Ginger to ask me to, to, to think about working with Cream and uh, the rest is history, really. Uh, yeah, that's the way it happened. So. Was there a major jump from sort of just writing poetry to then writing lyrics, you know, to fit to music? Did you find that? Did you actually sit down and uh, when you, when you first started writing? Because obviously, eventually, you, you you teamed up with Jack Bruce. Yeah. Um, was it a partnership when you when you started writing the material? Did you actually sit down together to write, or did you write lyrics and then give them to Jack? Well, the first experience, as I recall it, was I got this call from Ginger saying, we're in the studio, we've done this track, would you like to come down and write some lyrics? So I got thrown in at the deep end. However, um, I had spent half my life sitting in the cinema watching millions of films because I'm a film addict. Um, and also I'd spent the rest of it listening to jazz and blues. And I had a a reasonable appreciation of what a lyric should be. I had a good knowledge, for instance, of the standard repertoire, and I also had a good knowledge of blues lyrics. Um, quite a varied thing of blues lyrics from early stuff like Victoria Spivey, who I really love, was a complete surrealist kind of blues person, to the Chicago thing of Muddy Waters and, and then B.B. King and Memphis um, and some of the country stuff like, like uh, Robert Johnson and Sleepy John Estes and Blind Willie McTell. I, I was actually into all that. I loved it. And I, I sort of... It was like Jack once said in a, in a quote uh, when he was being interviewed, he said, what we did was we took the blues idea and uh, we took the language of the blues and made it our own and that's sort of where I was going plus all this kind of film imagery now when it first started and we did the first track like wrapping paper it all came out in a rather indigestible mass but later on it settled down and then of course because I'd done extremely varied types of poetry in, in, in terms of the subject matter, then I was able to do quite a varied thing with lyric writing as well. So wherever we went subject-wise, from politician to weird of Hermiston to whatever we did, I, I, most of the time I was able to hang on and, 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 and get something reasonably authentic going with it, you know, that made some sense. Uh, you know, I had quite a lot of chops as a writer, because if you've been writing poetry for eight years, and, and quite a lot, and practising really hard and everything, then you do develop some chops. And so I was not unready. I was quite kind of prepared to go wherever the music took me. And when Jack and I eventually, or quite quickly, became partners, uh, um, became a team, then uh, Jack, of course, had an extremely fertile imagination musically, and it always struck me that a great deal of his music was telling stories. It, it was so. In a way, I felt like I was almost like a translator. If I could cotton on, if I could latch on to the right imagery that was in that music, 
then I would nail it, you know. And uh, an obvious example being theme for an imaginary Western, for instance, whereby um, it, he came with this music and, and, uh, and, and I immediately, it, it rem you know, I, I collect Westerns, you know, I love Westerns. And um, I, I recognised that some of the heritage was from Western film scores. It was also the Scottish thing was in there as well, because of him being Scottish. But um, th there was an element of people like Dmitry Tiomkin who wrote some of the best Western film scores. Um, and uh, I felt there was a kind of epic thing to it. But then again, I thought, what's this song about? Okay, yes, it's about, well, it's a Western, but it's also about the Graham Bond organisation, because the Graham Bond organisation was something I always saw as a mixture between kind of pioneers and outlaws. And uh, so it was about them, but it was also, and, and the early days of British rhythm and blues, and the, the, the wild personalities involved and their new types of experience um, uh, as musicians. Um, and then with the, uh, the underlying thing of the fact that we all liked Westerns as well and we were partly living that myth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then with something like White Room, for instance, then White Room started life as an eight-page poem. And when we were working with Cream, Cream were on the road all the time. There were very, very short gaps whereby we would get together and try and write for the next record. And um, so all the ideas were considered because we were short of time. And so uh, I had been to journalism college at one point. I didn't, didn't graduate, but I learned some techniques there as well, uh, notably the art of precy, uh, which is cutting things down. Uh, and um, uh, originally White Room was an eight-page poem. And then I thought, well, OK, there's an idea in there somewhere. Jack had the music, and I was trying to think, OK, well, I mean, what will go with what? And then I thought, OK, well, if I cut this down to a one-page lyric, then this might actually work with this music. And in point of fact, it did. So uh, that was another way that we worked. Most of the time, he had the music. But every now and then, I would come with an idea. Politician was something I came with anyway. Um, White Room was something I came with, but the rest of them were all Jack's music. And then I just put, got into that. And then we became a kind of on-off partnership and worked together on and off for 48 years, which was one of the longest songwriting partnerships in, in mm. history. I think it's longer than Lieber and Stoller and people like that. It is, I think, yes, um, absolutely. I so, mean, very, very long-lived partnership. A lot of, and I think there's a great deal of truth in it. I read somewhere once where it, uh, somebody said, a writer a long time ago, said that sort of those, those early lyrics that you provided for Cream were some of the first uh, lyrics written for popular music that took lyrics out of just the basic moon and June kind of thing and, and did something far more serious with it. Um, beyond the, uh, the, the Cream experience, then you started writing for uh, you writing with other people. I mean, you, you contributed words by people like Coliseum. Mm. Um, but beyond that, you then started having your own performing career. Yes, I did. Um, what was the what was the first sort of musical group that you you uh, assembled around yourself? Well, what happened was that I was doing. I had my own jazz and poetry group, which gradually became less bebop orientated and more electric. Um, finally got John McLaughlin, who I loved, um, and we were doing quite experimental stuff. I mean, Phil Ryan, my music partner, actually said the first time he heard us playing down at Middle Earth, it sounded like something from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty far out. You know, um, John was doing terrible session work with, to earn a living for his then wife and children um, 
with people like Engelbert and 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 stuff like and really hating it because he was you know he had a, a wild imagination and he wanted to let it free, and I let him do what he wanted you know so we were pretty far out some of that stuff, and then I realised that it was a time when people were getting deals and and there was a a very and very interesting kind of openness to kind of cultural experiments within the music business. It had opened itself up a bit. And um, so I thought, I'm not really going to get a deal at the time. I, I tried for a few, just doing the poetry with the, with the electric music. Um, that didn't really happen. And then I thought, well, OK, I'm going to start to sing. I, I, I made some songs, which I did the melody and sang and taped, and I gave them to Graham Bond uh, for his band, and then his band broke up, and he wanted me to join up with him then and, and, and sing with him. And I said, I, I, I'm not a singer, you know. And he said, yeah, but you just sang these things and it sounded all right. So I, I thought, well, if Graham says that, of course, Graham was a great encourager. And he had motivations as well, you know, because I had already started writing hit songs for Cream. He wanted me to write them for him. <laughs> but but anyway, so part of it was butter, you know. And and and, and but anyway, I I took it as gospel up to a point, and 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 went okay. Well, I'm going to sing, and I started singing, and it, yeah, it wasn't very good, but it was singing of a kind. Um, and to start with, I thought, OK, well, I've had these great, great musicians for so long. You know, I mean, I've been with Stan Tracy and Bobby Wellens and John McLaughlin and Hextall Smith. And I thought, I've got to start at a different level because I'm not anywhere near any of these people. I've got to start doing something more modest uh, so I can kind of get into it. So I started with this band, which was just not very good. They just weren't that good. Um, and I thought, and gradually I got rid of them all and got better and better people and ended up with people like Chris Spedding and, 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 and Rob Tate and people who were great musicians anyway. And then we did the Battered Ornaments, and, and, um, which only lasted a year, but it made quite a splash and, and, and it launched me as a performer singer, really. Is that right that you actually left the Battered Ornaments just prior to them? Supporting the Rolling Stones in, in they Hyde threw Park. me out. They threw you out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they there was a put a, a, a coup, <laughs> and and just before which uh, yeah I mean my life's been good at things like that you know just being missing something really big at the last minute you know, <laughs> um, and yes we would have opened for the Rolling Stones at the Hyde Park thing and uh, that would have done us a lot of good because whatever it was. With me as frontman, we had an act, you know, which was unique. It was different. Yeah, as I say, my singing was no, not that great in those days. Uh, um, but um, uh, it, anyway, they kicked me out. You know, there was a there was a, a palace coup, <laughs> and uh, um, and then I immediately formed Pi Blocto with Jim Mullen. Which was a good move, you know. I was re I I was not going to be uh, deterred. I was already had the the addiction of being on the road, being an on the road working type musician. You know, I loved it, and so got Pi Blocto, and and then we were away again. You know, and 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 various versions of that, and then different bands afterwards, forever and ever and ever up to now. Because with Pub Lockto, you you had um, a lot of a lot of interest and, and success in in France. Yes. At that time. Yeah, and we had a number nine radio hit, which is uh, with a, with a very out of tune saxophone solo at the end of it. But but however, which was Walk for Charity, Run for Money. Um, an interesting song. I mean, it was it was a. You, the shape of it was real interesting. You know that you you don't get. M sort of hit songs like that with that kind of a shape, you know, very much. It's kind of different, you know. I mean, it's as it's as different as the great 
hits of Bacharach, you know, I mean, uh, which I love, you know, but which are also unbelievably musically sophisticated and very strange shapes, which people don't even notice, but they're there, mm. you know. Um, and, and we were doing some pretty far out stuff, there's no question about it, you know. Uh, and um, I was just about coping with it. Getting a bit better, but I was just about coping with it. Um, and then Phil joined, Phil Ryan joined in, in 1970. And that was a whole new ball game, you know. Then, then Phil and I were then st were to, sort of together for, for a bit and then not, and then again forever after that, you know. Um, we used to fight at first, you know. Phil still had some, well, was drinking a bit and, uh, and, um, well, you know, and um, we, we had some conflicts in the early days, but luckily that we, we got through them and resolved them, you know. Uh, uh, I worked at it because I loved him, you know. Uh, um, and that's another partnership that you, you've still maintained uh, yeah, up to, to this day. Sure, yeah, yeah. I just did a record last year, in fact. So when, when Pablo Octo sort of Dissolved. What actually happened there? Why did it, considering that you did have uh, sort of some degree of notoriety yeah. on, the, on the underground yeah. sort of circuit, yeah. why did that band fold, and what led to you teaming up with, with Graham Bond? Um, <laughs> well, there's a story that that um, our then manager, the guy that tried to manage me and Graham, I say tried to, it's very really difficult. Um, and he said, "Guess what? I've just been down to the record shop." And there's one of your records, Pete, in the same remainder bin as one of Graham's. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were yesterday's people, but not on the continent, you know, not, not in Germany and France and places. So we went out there and we did millions of gigs in France and Germany. Pi Blocto had gradually fallen away. It, it, it gradually lost its spirit. And there were other temptations out there. Um, Phil joined Man, and I thought I didn't really want to go on with it after that, and uh, went with Graham for a year. Graham being my mentor and hero, um, and he was not in great shape by then. Um, and uh, we did some great gigs. We did do some great gigs, and a few really terrible ones. Uh, and then he got ill, and then it fell apart. Um, and uh, and that was the time when I dropped out a little bit and became an A and R person at at Decca. I was going <laughs> to ask you about this because I don't think many people realise you were actually uh, an A and R person for Decca, yeah. uh, associated with the Diram label. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, and that's right. Which is uh, where your album, The Not Forgotten Association, that's right, which came we're from. talking about. Yeah. Um, Talking of that album, I mean that was that was a, that was a really interesting record because it, it, it does combine everything about you from poetry, sort of jazz music. Yeah, uh, it, it's just it's just one of those records now that I don't think you could, you could never envisage being made these days. No, but well, a, a, a great record nonetheless. Yeah. Um, well, could you tell me a little bit about the background to the making of that album? Well, it was a s simple, really. I mean, <clears throat> my manager at the time, David Apps, was a lovely guy. And he was always looking for things for me to do. And he was pretty well connected. He knew everyone in the business, you know. And he said, why don't you, after the experience with Graham, I was in the studio doing demos with this band that I had with the same rhythm section that we'd had with Graham, with Ed Spevak and Tommy Duffy and, and um, uh, Derek Foley and, and with Max Middleton on keyboards. And we were writing all this stuff. Me and Max were writing most of it. And I didn't let go, but I. But David said, you're really good at putting bands together and getting sessions together and stuff like that. Why don't you think about, you know, I can get you some money, you'll have a, expenses, you can run around and you, you know where a lot of the good music is. Go and take a look, you know, and, 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 and um, work for... Worked for the enemy for a little <laughs> while, <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, uh, I, I was quite burned by the by the experience with Graham because I, I was very upset at the way it had gone, and so I thought, okay, something new 
you know. And uh, uh, so I went out there. I went out on the road and looked at bands and did stuff and got involved in the whole corruption of the other side of the business, <laughs> you know, which I, there are some stories which I tell in my book, which are quite unpleasant, really, you know, uh, uh, um, how things got done. Um, and produced a few things and and and, uh, and then gradually drifted back into doing gigs again and and and, and formed the next band which was the flying tigers um, which never actually made a record they did demos and stuff um, part of what we're talking about mm. uh, doing this reissue there's some flying tigers tracks there which are quite good actually some of them are really interesting um, and uh, yeah, the 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 A and R experience was was fairly ugly, really. And it, it, you know, learning how things got done on that side of the business, the major, the the, the dying major label, um, which had gone really senile, you know, um, and they were trying to prop it up with things, but it didn't. It wasn't really working. Nothing I could have done would have saved it. <laughs> yes, because you, you came in, in uh, really the last days of last when, when, when Deram was, right. was there. That's what, right. what sort of artists did you, did you actually work with there? Uh, uh, well, I worked, worked with Mike Hart, who's a Liverpool guy who'd been um, signed to Dandelion. Um, I was trying to work with a band called the... Called, um, the Mama Flyer, which were from Edinburgh, which became the Flying Tigers later on when they all moved to London. Um, I was doing some stuff with an all-girl, four women songwriters, um, uh, which I tried to put together into a band so that they all did stuff together, and that was kind of interesting, and some of that we did never came out. Um, we did a single with Mike Hart. I did the, the single that you like, um, uh, spend my nights in armour oh, and, yes, and barbed yes. wire nightdress yeah. with an all star lineup of Jeff Beck and Jack Bruce and everybody, which somehow they managed to ignore. <laughs> uh, and then they said, Oh, we'd like a poetry album in the catalogue. We don't have anything. Do you want to do one? <laughs> and I went, Sure, you know, I, why not? I wasn't doing that much poetry at the time, the odd reading. But I had a load of stuff and, and, and also some ideas for doing some poetry and music numbers, which I was um, had some help from people like Max Middleton and Taff Williams and, and Viv Stanshall on tuba on one track. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I first met Viv, which was after a Cream concert, which the Bonzos had supported, um, Viv said to me, I've got this great idea. And I said, what, what is it? He said, well, I'm going to have a, a tuba run over by a steamroller. So I'm going to be seen to be playing a two-dimensional tuba, a flat <laughs> tuba, you know. And I thought, great, that's really good, you know. Oh, well, it impressed me anyway at the time, being an old surrealist, you know. And, and um, so then... Uh, I, I had this number which was about the jazz that I loved from the twenties, and um, I got Viv to come and play tuba <laughs> on it, you know, which he did. It was good, you know. So a lot of the material on the, some of the poems on the album um, yeah. go back quite to, to sort of your early early yes, days. Yes, they don't go they? back as far as about 1958, 59, uh, and my new book of poetry, which is coming out soon. Um, I've got an archive section in it of st stuff that wasn't published from those days. I mean, I haven't had a book of poetry published since 1973 anyway, because I'd not... Yeah, I've always done the odd poetry reading when people wanted me to, um, but mostly I was writing lyrics and doing music uh, um, uh, and, and then some film work. Uh, so I, I wasn't... Uh, that bothered with poetry for quite a long time and then about maybe 10, 15 years ago I started writing it again because I realised there were some things I wanted to say 
that could only fit into that kind of personal way of expression. Uh, and so, um, so I'm now doing it occasionally. I, you know, and I do a few poetry readings again now, which I, I love. You know, I'm quite happy to do it. You know, I mean, a gig's a gig to me. You know, you know, you do this or do you do that, but it's fine. You know, I like it anyway. So, so in the seventies, you carried on uh, writing. You you still wrote with Jack Bruce. Yeah. You, you you did uh, various things like that. But as as you said, for for a lot of intents and purposes, you know, you'd sort of vanished off the music scene and gradually you sort of came back into it yeah. uh, a, a lot more. What, what sort of coached you back into the, well, into that side of things again? There was a kind of funny thing because punk happened, you know. I won't say too many things about that because it makes me terribly angry. <laughs> um, it was the first kind of mode of music that the record companies had more or less invented, you know. Uh, um, and it was the clothes came first, um, and then the people and the music to fit the clothes. Uh, I didn't approve of it. I hated it. And also what it did over a period of years was because it was amateurs, then it destroyed the, the immensely valuable skill base that had been uh, developed in the British music business. And I was terribly angry about that because... I, I like people that can play and sing and write and everything. And um, I thought it did a lot of damage, really. I know it did physical damage in the sense that uh, the album sales disappeared and, and, and people didn't trust the music business anymore for foisting a lot of crap on them, you know. Uh, um, took a long time to, eat, to get anywhere near recovery. And so... Um, but but I won't carry on uh, about the manipulations that went on. Um, so I, I was so disgusted with all that that I left, basically. Nobody cared, no one gave a toss and nobody noticed, really. But I thought, I'm not going to do this anymore. This bit this is really disgusting. I hated it. And, um, and we were, I was still doing gigs. 1977, I had a great band called Back to the Front and, and we were doing gigs. And people would come up to me afterwards and say, the Sex Pistols were here the, a couple of nights ago. They were really fucking dreadful, you know. Nobody could stand it. And it was all hyped. Everything was totally hyped. Uh, and they said, what you're doing, we love it. You know, why isn't there more of that? You know, and I, of course, the thing that was really selling was disco. It was really mm -hmm. Donna, Donna Summer was the one that was really doing it. Um, I didn't belong there, so I left. And, and I started writing film screenplays for, for, I got an agent and you know, I was getting the odd commission and I, I could write, you know, and, and um, unfortunately that at that point the British film industry was non-existent. We were down to making about 30 films a year and uh, a lot of those were television films that would play for today, which were really films, but they were really good, some of those. Um, and I got commissioned to write some of those which never got made in the end, you know. They were always over commissioned because they were paying you very little money because they could afford it. Um, and um, I, I loved films, so I was uh, gradually... And, and then uh, I produced a few records. I got asked to produce a couple of things and then I, I enjoyed that. And then I formed a production company um, and uh, made a couple of things and uh, took them to various record companies. Nobody wanted them at the time. So I then formed a label and took it to a distributor and they liked it. And so we were in, not exactly in business, but we did the first thing under, under the name of uh, Brown and Ryan, which was the Ardors of the Lost Rake. Which nobody still, the people still look at that title and they go, what do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, we, we did that and I did a Hextall Smith record which had quite a long life and got reissued a number of times and everybody liked that. And I realised that I was becoming a kind of producer. And as I was producing more and more, then... People would ask me to do little bits on the records, like I would play bits of percussion, or I would sing some backing vocals, a little bit here and there, I was get, which I was getting better at, because I was... By that time, I was studying singing. I, I was having 
uh, proper singing lessons for over six years and getting more and more competent so people were more inclined to say hey why don't you do that back in vocal there you know I mean, yeah so I would do a few things and of course gra gradually got addicted to the music again you know um, and eventually Phil and I went back out on the road in, in 93 uh, with uh, what became known as the Interocitus. Um, and we did that for a while, and a couple of records, and, uh, and then Phil's wife became very ill and he spent nine years looking after her. And, and we carried on writing, but we didn't do any recording or any gigs anymore. I, I kept the band and we carried on doing a few gigs here and there. And it was like a kind of a mixture between uh, doing some cream things and some things I wrote with Jack and stuff from the catalogue that Phil and I had written and a few other bits and pieces from my catalogue, you know. And we, you know, we were doing small gigs. Nobody really wanted it that much. Um, and uh, the low point of it was doing a gig down in Dorset where... Um, a cream tribute band were top of the bill and getting more money than we were. <laughs> <laughs> Which was quite miserable, actually. Um, uh, and that was when the plague of tribute bands start, yes. started, of course. Some of which were really funny names. There was one called Clap Tonight. <laughs> and another one, there was a Bon Jovi tribute band called By Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> Some of it was quite funny, you know. I mean, and 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 Phil did a gig um, on the same bill as the Australian Pink Floyd, and it, and he said to them, uh, "Are you going to play on the dark side of the billabong?" <laughs> and they didn't understand. They didn't get it at all. <laughs> it <was> all <laughs> but you still also you you you. In more recent times, you've, you've turned your sort of attention to sort of gigging in Europe as well. You were saying you're, mm. you're, you're doing things with with a Hamburg blues band. Well, the Hamburg blues band was like a rather looser version of of the old John Mayall band in terms of its establishment uh, uh, value over there. They they work enormously. You know, they do fifty gigs every winter. You know, and stuff like that. I mean, as a they're, they're a very well established band and they over the years had featured numbers of people that I knew like everyone from Munch Moore on keyboards to backing Jack every now and then um, having and, and um, Clem Clemson worked with them and Miller Anderson and Maggie Bell and I started off when Hextall Smith was doing it he, he did it for many years and um, uh, he did it and then he rode me into doing some of the writing um, and then they asked me to do it as guest singer as well. So I did that a lot, you know, we did hundreds of gigs in, well, it felt like hundreds anyway. <laughs> it was certainly um, many, many gigs in, in Germany with the Burgers. Um, and, uh, and that was an experience. I mean, it was loud. It was kind of blues rock. They had one guitar player who, who, whose name shall be nameless, uh, and they would always stick me in front of his amplifier, and he would all. I mean, he's a good musician, really good player, but he would always play millions of notes at the highest possible volume, <laughs> and I'd get half deaf after each gig, you know. Um, uh, but that was yeah, it was a good experience. It kept my kept my chops in kept my name around in Germany, which had become uh, the kind of stomping ground for all us British oldies, um, up to a point. Um, and, and I was getting well paid for it, and I, uh, and I was enjoying the hell out of it, you know, really, in lots of ways. Um, and they're talking about doing some more this year with me in it. I, I'm not sure. I'm, Maybe. I mean, in which case, I'm always up for that, you know, because a gig's a gig, you know. I mean, as as long as it's with people that can play and, and sing, I always do it, you know, as long as it, I feel it's within my capability. Uh, but no, I had some great times with the Burgers and wrote quite a few of their songs. 
um, some of which did a bit of business, you know, here and there, which was nice. Um, and then did stuff of my own in Germany uh, as well. Um, when Phil and I got back together again after his wife died, then we did some touring over there with our current band, the, the, the Soul Cordelia, um, and um, also worked over in Switzerland quite a lot with, with a guy called Paul Camilleri, produced one of his records, toured with his band, um, and also Clem Clemson, who did his own band over in Germany, and I toured with that, because he, Clem had not sung a whole lot of lead before. He was always a very good harmony singer, did that forever, um, uh, and was a little bit, I think, a little bit worried about carrying a whole gig. So he did some of them with Chris Farlow, and then he did some of them with me. Uh, and that was a nice experience, you know, because Clem's band was fantastic, great band. Um, American, black American bass player, Reggie, um, a German drummer, and a keyboard player from Sheffield who's lived in Hamburg for years, Adrian. Great, great players. That was a really hot band. Um, but I always come back to feeling happier doing my own band, you know, but it being nine, a nine piece band, you know, then people are sometimes quite leery about booking it, you know, because they think it's going to be ten hotel rooms and Christ knows what, you know. So we're doing a few festivals maybe, but, you know, maybe when the film comes out then they'll be a bit more, you know, they'll be a bit more of it. Well, I was going to sort of bleed on to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've, you've recently, uh, a, a documentary um, has, has virtually been completed about about your life and career with, yeah. with uh, featuring interviews with uh, everyone who's sort of played a part in that mm. as well. Um, mm. How does it feel to sort of look back on something like that and sort of watch, watch, watch the rushes of a documentary and sort of see your, your life presented in, in, that, in that form? I have to be careful because <laughs> I'm luckily the director I've had a partnership with him for a long time because we're writing screenplays together and we will hopefully do our first low-budget feature film uh, uh, later on this year. Uh, so we're mates and he's you know, a young guy um, but very, very talented. And he... It was really his idea to do it. Um, and then we found a couple of producers that were doing a series of things about... 60s musicians, including David Graham and possibly Alexis, and they thought it was a good idea, so they backed it a little bit, you know, so we got all the stuff filmed. It's a funny thing, because I'm... Luckily, as I say, Mark, the director, is a stickler for authenticity as well as, as I am. And then again, he's done a very impressionistic thing, and he's made it very dramatic about the relationship in particular between me and Jack and Ginger and Eric. Um, so there's quite a lot of actual drama and, and, and the way he's cut it is very meaningful in terms of how it shows you how the relationships stack up against each other, you know. Um, and uh, I have been one of the producers of it because, for various reasons, it was only me that could get certain people on board and that required quite a lot of effort. And I was the only one that really ha could do that. Um, and, and, and some of it took quite a lot of heaving and straining to actually do it, but, but, but it got done in the end. So, obviously... <laughs> Because we've worked together a lot, me and Mark, and we've written together a lot, then we do have respect for each other's space. So I'm not going to go, OK, well, OK, that may be your best lick, but it's not quite right. Because I'm not going to do that to him, because it, if it's his best lick, then it's pretty damn good, you know. So I'm not actually going to do that. On the other hand, I, c I could well, when I'm looking at the, you know, when he's doing bits of editing or having an overview and say, look, that bit there, that's not quite right, that could go there, you know. 
and he, usually he'll listen to me because I'm four times as old as he is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he, my gravitas actually sits heavily on his head, you know. <laughs> and so um, he sometimes he'll listen to that, you know. And, and, and uh, but we will discuss it in a non non aggressive kind of way, you know. We have a pact, you know, and and. Um, so his best things are there, you know. I don't mess with them, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, and then he, because I have ideas, you know. I've got, he's got a good imagination. And I've got a good imagination. Still, there's something left of it. And therefore, if I get a really good idea, then then he'll go. He'll generally go for it, you know. He'll say, "Oh, yeah, that makes sense. We can do that. We can put that." That'll work, you know. So we, we, we're collaborating properly. I mean, I've always been a collaborator. You know, I always like to work with other people. I mean, the, the hardest thing I ever had to do was when I got the deal for my autobiography. That was hellish. Two and a half years of seeing their writing. I mean, not every day, but, you know, a long, long time. And that hurt, because I really need other people to work off, you know. I... I feel most... I'm a social animal and I feel much, much happier having other people to work off, you know. So doing that on my own, not that I can't do it and not that it's not all right, but it's very, very painful. It's because there's just me. And, and well, I'm quite happy in my own body and everything. I mean, you know, I'm not, not saying that I, I don't like that, but at the same time, the writing thing and being a writer of a book was not where I ever saw myself at all. And so it was a funny place to be, and, and it, up to a point it hurt, you know. And then I was also trying to be... I was trying to do something different in terms of, of, of autobiography, which I was trying to be incredibly honest, if I could, as much as I allowed myself to be. <laughs> I mean, there was some things I couldn't say, but... because <laughs> they're too horrible, but... but, but, but um, <laughs> But mostly I was being really, really honest. And um, uh, some of that was a bit painful. I mean, but I, I gritted my teeth because it's what I really wanted. I wanted it not to be full of bullshit and, and, and saying that I was things that I wasn't. And also, I also wanted it to be a lot about failure, you know, because I've had a lot of... Yeah, you know, I've had a good life. I, you know, it, it, it's been, uh, compared to some people I know, it's been uh, relatively easy. Uh, but at the same time, because I am, I am the mad artist, the same as other mad artists, and or every mad artist gets his times of frustration and, and, and he gets his times of failure, you know. Some of it just doesn't work, or it's you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and it doesn't work, it doesn't happen. Um, and I'm not saying that's caused me incredible suffering or anything like that, and it's not made me into sticking needles into myself or, or, or going back to, to, to drinking and eating speed like I did before 1967. But, um, you know, they're regular day-to-day -day frustrations and, 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 and also, you know, you, you, whether you like it or not, if you are some kind of artist, then you do like some people to take a little bit of notice of you every now and then, you know, and because and, you think you've got something to say. And I don't think that's a total illusion, because I think I am different from other people in that respect. I've got different things to say in a different way. But when nobody takes any notice or the business has shut down um, uh, because you're wearing the wrong clothes or you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, then, of course, those things are part of a, a, a general frustration which can't be avoided. You just have to get through it, you know. Luckily, I don't wilt and melt away into the background, but I just do something else uh, or, or I carry on, you know. Um, I always quote, which I do, I, I, um, uh, I always quote Screaming Jay Hawkins, a line from Screaming Jay Hawkins, who's one of my idols. And uh, uh, he's got this line where he says, uh, I don't care if you don't love me, I'm yours. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's from one of his versions of I Put a Spell on You. And 
And I, I, I feel the same way. You've got to be like that. If you're an artist, you, you know, even an artist with a small A, you know, uh, um, or, you know, then, then uh, you've got to believe in yourself uh, and you've got to keep on, you know, keep on with it. Uh, and I think that's something you've, you've, you've done really throughout your career. I think one of the impressive things about you is that you, you've just carried on sort of re reinventing various things and, and sort of rolling with the knocks occasionally and, and, and coming back. One thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of finish on really is that um, obviously last, um, recently you, you sort of worked with Jack Bruce on, on the album Civil Rails. Sure. That was, that was some time yeah. after not writing with Jack yeah. again. I, I, I think some of the songs on that album are probably some of the finest things that you've, you've written with, yeah. with Jack. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you got back together with him after, after that, did it, was it an easy thing to write, write with him again on that? Well, funnily enough, I, I was, for various reasons, we weren't terribly happy with each other for a bit. Um, but there have been periods like that at, at various times in our relationship, you know. And um, I love the guy, you know, and... and but sometimes it was, you know, we had our reasons for not being together. And uh, he called me, you know, and he said, look, I'm going to do another record, you know. Um, I'd like you to be involved in it. And I thought to myself, I knew he was ill. I didn't, didn't know quite how ill he was, but I knew he was ill. And I thought, why wouldn't I do this? You know, am I really going to say, no, I can't do this? I'm not going to do that. And fun enough, um, it turned out to be a very good experience. Um, we just got on with it, basically. I think he knew that there was a limited amount of time to get it together in. Um, and I devoted whatever time I, I, you know, as much time as was necessary to getting the things right. And uh, because of the nature of some of the music and, and stuff, uh, and some of the stuff we were we were doing together um, it, it came together relatively easily uh, and it was a, a for me a very very good experience I have to say it was it was a very we didn't fight we just got on with it uh, we were social quite in quite a nice way civil you know um, and rational about discussing where the stuff went and how it should be presented and put together. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased that we did it. Um, I'm very pleased that we did it together. And I think it's a very good record. I mean, I, I, Rob Cass is a great producer. He would incredibly sympathetic approach to it. Um, and um, and as you say, I, I, I think a lot of the songs that we did came out very, very, very well. They came out as well as one could have expected them, you know. I mean, they were really on it, on the money. Uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, I'm very glad that I got involved in it. And, yeah, I think it's a real good piece of work, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, something that I... Very glad to have, have been part of, uh, you know. And Jack, Jack did a great job on it. You know, he worked real hard. He wasn't very well, um, and he came through with flying colours. Really, I mean, I, yeah, I listened to it quite a lot, and, and I know people really have a lot of respect for it. And, and people actually do say. Some people have said to me, well. This is one of the best, definitely probably the best thing that you've done since Songs for a Tailor or something like that. You know, they compare it with some of those early things where we were really, really uh, uh, going great guns, you know. So there is a thing there. And Jack said to me, he said, look, I want this to be an old person's record. He actually said that to me. He said, uh, you know, we're not pretending to be anything we're not anymore. We protect. We we are who we are. This is how old we are. This is what we're doing. You know, it's how we are. And I obviously respected that. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm doing the same thing basically as well. But we're 
at the moment without the illness, you know. But but um, uh, and and it came out great. I I've, I've got no absolutely no problems with it at all. I love the thing. Um, it's a great. It was a great way to. We were planning another one, um, as you know, but uh, along came the Grim River. But um, uh, nevertheless, I think it was a very, very good way to say goodbye. Very, very good for him. You know, the performances were great that he did. Uh, and, um, and the writing was right on the money. I, th I thought we, we both did a good job, you know. I'm, I'm proud of it. Uh, Absolutely. And... This year, as I said, I started the interview saying that you've, you have a lot of activity yourself. So you have the film, you have um, the, the, uh, the celebration of the Albert Hall Poetry yeah. event. And um, you're still gigging. Up to a point. Do, I'd like to do more. Do you ever see yourself stopping? <laughs> well, I suppose I will get too decrepit to do it, you know. I mean, uh, the thing about gigging is... is if, if you can, always finish the gig before you die, you know. <laughs> I mean, John Lee Hooker gigged till he was 83 and then died after a gig. But at least you've got to try and finish the gig if you can. You know, that's the main <laughs> thing, you know, before you actually part. The, the bad thing is to, is to die in the middle of the gig, you know, that's a bad one. <laughs> you know, the, the great jazz saxophone player Warren Marsh died in the middle of a gig when he was playing Out of Nowhere. <laughs> Which was really heavy, I thought. So you always got to try and finish your gig, you know. That's why I'm... Well, you know, I'll, I'll try and stay there for as long as I can. Uh, I've done quite a few this year, and there's more coming up. Uh, um, let's hope I can carry on doing them for as long as possible. I'm only, I'm only 74, for Christ's sake. A mere boy, really. And Pete, well... May you long continue to do so. And thank you very much for talking Thanks. to us on Cherry Red TV today. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers.